We're on lesson number eight that is dealing with 1844 made simple. Distinctive doctrines. I'm going to quote from this uh, magazine. There are two distinctive doctrines uh, for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In other words, in many respects, we're like every other Christian. First and foremost is the investigative judgment. Now, they're actually correct about that. It is a distinctive doctrine. In other words, you can find a lot of Sabbath-keeping churches. We don't have uh, a monopoly on the Sabbath truth. Uh, there are Seventh-day Baptists, Seventh-day Charismatic, Seventh-day Methodists, all these Sabbath-keeping churches, uh, Worldwide Church of God, Church of God, Seventh-day, a lot of different uh, Sabbath-keeping churches around the world. It's in the Bible. It's, uh, it goes way back even before the organization of our denomination. We're not the only church that has the truth about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not the only church that has the truth about baptism by immersion. We're not the only truth that ha church that has the truth about uh, the state of the dead. Uh, one of the famous uh, theologians today, John Stott, uh, Edwin Fudge, a lot of other theologians. It's very plain in the Bible. But the investigative judgment, or 1844, sometimes simplified, is something unique with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, uh, then they go on and they add a paragraph. This is the unbiblical concept that in 1844, Jesus entered into the second and last phase of his atoning ministry, the work of the investigative judgment. Instead of returning to earth October 22, 1844, as William Miller predicted, Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven and began a review of the works of all believers who have ever lived to determine how faithful we are to the commandments of God. Now, that's not a quote. That's his own wording. It's not actually accurate. Uh, Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken uh, will not be pardoned. Well, that's the Bible. Whoever repents and forsakes his sins will have mercy. So his problem is not with our teaching, it's with the Bible there. Um, and blotted from the books of record, but will stand as a witness against the sinner. Anyway, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. And, uh, I was reluctant to even show that to you because I certainly don't endorse within the magazine. But I just wanted to highlight, this is one of the biggest problems that other churches have with Seventh-day Adventists is our belief in 1844 in the investigative judgment. Now, I don't claim to be a great theologian. It always made perfect sense to me that, first of all, if it tells us in Revelation 22, Behold, he comes, and his reward is with him to give to every man. Some judgment takes place before he comes, if he's rewarding people when he does come. Is that rocket science? Yeah, that to me I think is very simple. It says emphatically many places in the Bible that Jesus is our high priest. Are we still together? Amen. And that he is interceding in our behalf in heaven. It tells us there is a temple in heaven. It outlines all the different apartments and the furniture of that temple in heaven. In Revelation, Isaiah's vision... Uh, not to mention the Old Testament pattern. So the concept that Christ would do as the high priest does and enter into a special final phase, I don't know why that bothers people so much. You, you know what I think bothers them? A couple of issues dealing with uh, this subject. Um, one is, it really troubles people to think that a Christian must live a life where they are guarded about their behavior. They want to come to the altar, say a prayer, and then say, I am now saved and can't be lost. They don't like the idea that we're going to be reviewed, that we will give an account. Judgment is a troubling truth. And so this concept of a holy life that will be evaluated is very troubling to Christians that have lapsed into salvation by presumption, or once saved, always saved. It disturbs them. And Seventh-day Adventists that leave the faith and join another church, one thing that troubles them more than anything else is this concept that we do need to live a holy life, that it could be presumptuous to say, I'm saved and can't be lost. Because the Bible says that we should examine ourselves, prove ourselves, that we should uh, realize that we are living in the sight of a holy God. We shouldn't be sloppy. We should be sober. We should be vigilant. And that's actually some of my sermon content for the next uh, uh, message or worship service. So... Uh, let me get to the heart of the verse. Go with me in your Bibles, and, and I'll be going to the lesson. I'll ask you to share a few verses with me. In our Bibles, 1844 springs from a verse in a prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. And sometimes people just read the prophecy and they miss what the point is. Daniel chapter 8, uh, and I'm going to go to verse 12. This is a prophecy that talks about the little horn power. It begins in verse 9, but we're going to jump to verse 12. So the context is a little horn power in this fifth kingdom. The four kingdoms first being Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then you've got the Rome, the iron and clay, the, this little horn power that we believe is the, the beast of Rome that has commingled with religion, okay, which became the papacy. And it says in verse 12, because of transgression an army was given over to the horn. Well, we know in 538 the Pope received an army from Justinian to uh, uproot three other horns of powers. To oppose the daily sacrifice. What is the daily sacrifice? 
What did the daily sacrifice mean to the Jewish people? The daily sacrifice was the gospel. It was the plan of salvation that this lamb and the sacrifice of this lamb would atone for their sins. The taking away of the daily sacrifice in prophecy means that the true gospel of salvation by faith in the blood of the lamb was going to be taken away and it would be replaced by sal salvation by works, prayers, burning of candles, praying to saints, and a lot of paganism. The daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary cast down. What is the place of his sanctuary? Now, this is one of the most important things to understand if you're going to understand the investigative judgment in 1844. And I'll be so bold as to say even the founding fathers and mothers of our movement did not fully understand this. Because truth is progressive. You know, sometimes it's true that people who are actually living the fulfillment of a prophecy don't recognize it and it's only those looking back afterward that see it. Did the disciples know when Jesus was dying on the cross that they were watching the fulfillment of prophecy? They had no idea. What, they couldn't figure this out. They said, this is not matching up with prophecy. We don't understand it. All right, let's, let's talk about the temple for a second, the sanctuary. I wasn't going to do it in this order, but I think it's going to make more sense this way. How many sanctuaries were there in the Old Testament? Time. Well, over the course of Jewish history, there were three. The portable tabernacle built by Moses in the wilderness, right? That was the a mobile sanctuary. Then you had the first permanent one built by Solomon that David basically, uh, he footed the bill for that and gathered the material. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Later they came back and under the time of Ezra and Nehemiah they built the third one that was then later uh, embellished by Herod the Great. That's the third earthly temple. But all during that time when Moses built the first temple, how many temples were there? Two, one on earth and one in heaven. Am I right? God told Moses to build it after the pattern. Pattern of what? The original. Okay, so there were two, one on earth and one in heaven. Now, we have a memory verse in our lesson. I want you to say it with me. You thought I forgot about that. Uh, by the way, the lesson title is 1844 Made Simple. Memory verse is Matthew 27, 51. Why don't you say this with me? Matthew 27, 51. It's in your lesson. Of course, it's in your Bible. You ready? Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The rocks were rent, King James says. When Jesus died and the veil in the earthly temple was torn, that was an extremely significant event for a few reasons. First of all, one of the prophecies in Daniel 9 said he would cause the sacrifice to cease. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he now was the fulfillment of the whole sacrificial system. He caused the sacrifice to cease that day. And the whole purpose of the earthly temple then met its fulfillment. It was transferred. When Jesus died, he said, destroy this temple made with hands and in three days I'll raise it up. Something happened when Christ died. The whole economy switched from the types and symbols to the reality. From the lambs to the Lamb of God. From the time that Jesus died, did they need any more to sacrifice lambs? No, he's the lamb now. What about the temple? Did they need the old priesthood? Or was there a new priesthood now? The, the priesthood of every believer. You are a royal priesthood, right? New sacrifice, new priesthood. If it's got a new sacrifice and a new priesthood, is there a new temple? Where is the temple? Ah, two temples still. There is a temple in heaven. And Christ told Mary, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. When Jesus ascended to the Father in heaven, listen carefully, He first ascended to the Holy of Holies, Holy of Holies, I meant what I said, activated the heavenly temple. Because what was being pled in a heavenly temple until Jesus died on the cross? What would you do? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There was no blood being pled until Christ died. Are you still with me? Then He came back down to earth, he said, all hail. Then he let him worship him. Then he began when he ascended after 40 days his ministry in the holy place until 1844. But when Moses, well, let me take you back. In Leviticus 16, once a year on the Day of Atonement, what we call Yom Kippur, the high priest went in for the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? Only once a year, with one exception. One exception. When the temple was first built, Hebrew says Moses went in and he sprinkled all the furniture with blood to consecrate it, activate it. When they, they finished the earthly temple, they consecrated it. They, you know, they break a bottle of champagne on a ship when they send it off. That's not how you consecrate a temple. It's with blood. And they went in and they consecrated that earthly temple and Moses went into the Holy of Holies to activate it. From then on, they only went in at the end of the year for the Day of Atonement. Christ did the same thing when he first ascended. That's why so many people got all disturbed a few years ago when Brother Ford was challenging where Jesus went. 
And they thought that to admit that he did at one point go into the Holy of Holies when he ascended was to concede what happened in 1844. Not at all. Yes, of course he went in there. He activated it. He was enthroned. He, his sacrifice was accepted. Then he came back down to earth and he said, All hail. They worshipped him. He met with him for 40 days, poured out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, ascended to heaven 10 days before Pentecost, and began his work as our high priest. What would happen in the first department? Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now when Jesus died on the cross, we know there's a temple in heaven. Everyone together on that? Hebrews is so clear. Hebrews chapter 8, we now have a high priest that has entered into the heavenly temple, not made with men's hands, but the heavenly. I'm paraphrasing. Is there still a temple on earth? Now when you talk about unto 2,300 days the sanctuary will be cleansed. Oh wait a second, I never finished reading. I go back to Daniel chapter 8. It says the place of his sanctuary was cast down. I'm in verse 11 of Daniel 8. So the sanctuary being cast down. Let's, it's the sanctuary of truth being cast down. It's the sanctuary in heaven and on earth under attack. And an army was given. And he cast the truth to the ground. And he practiced and prospered. So what is happening to the sanctuary? The truth is cast to the ground. There is a sanctuary on earth too. Now this is very good Bible. This is not some strange teaching. Let me read you a few verses. First of all, when Jesus began his ministry, he said, You have made my father's house a den of thieves. My, my father's house a den of thieves. At the end of his ministry, after they rejected the truth, he said, Your house has left you desolate. Then he died on a cross. A veil was rent. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, it didn't happen in the temple. It happened in an upper room. Because there's a new temple now. It's people. The church is the body of Christ. Christ said, Destroy this temple made with hands. And in three days I'll raise it up. Isn't that what he said? And what does it go on to say? He spoke of his body. What is the church now? The body of Christ. Let me read you a few verses. I'll get you to help me. 1 Peter 2.5. Who has 1 Peter 2.5? Jason? You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Thank you. Does Peter teach there is a spiritual house where spiritual sacrifices are, altered, are offered? Is that what we, what we just read? We're living stones in that temple. Christ is the cornerstone. We are built up on that on the living stones. Who has Ephesians 2 verse 19 to 22? Got a few hands here. Uh, I think Bertie's the closest. If, I always want whatever's expedient to get the, the scriptures read. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Thank you. Do you see it again? We are the temple of God on earth. Let me give you more. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, 16 and 17. If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, am I making up some new doctrine? Or is there still a temple on earth? Amen. Which temple ye are? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Not just, is your body the temple of the Holy Spirit? But he's saying, ye, ye, them. It's plural here. You got that? I will dwell in them and walk with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. My people are a temple. I dwell in them. He inhabits his church. You are the body of Christ. Let me give you another verse. Um, in uh, first, let me see here. I want to go to 1 Chronicles 20, no, 1 Chronicles 17. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 11. And I've quoted this many times because it's a very powerful prophecy in the Old Testament. And let me give you the context here. Um, David is getting old. He wants to build a temple for God. He is musing about doing this. He mentions it to Nathan the prophet. Nathan comes back with a prophecy and says, you're not to build the temple, but your son will. Here's that prophecy. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 11 and 12. It'll come to pass when your days are expired, when you die, that you must go to be with your fathers. I will raise up your seed after thee, and he will be of your sons. I will establish his kingdom. He will build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. Who is the son of David? This is a good example of a dual prophecy in the Bible. Did David have a son named Solomon that built a physical temple? Did that one last forever? Did Solomon's throne last forever? Who is this really talking about? Did David have another son? Isn't Christ called the son of David? Did he build a house? Amen. Jesus was a carpenter. He built a house. He didn't make chairs. <laughs> I don't know what he made. But I believe he built a house. <laughs> Jesus was a carpenter. You are the temple that he built. You are the house that Jesus built. Of your sons, he will build me a house that will last forever. 
So, how many temples right now? Right? You're sitting here. How many temples are there? Two. One on earth and one in heaven. So when God says in 1844, Christ would, or in 2,300 days, Christ would cleanse his sanctuary in heaven. Two temples being cleansed. So many people argue about what was happening with the temple in heaven, and it's sure hard. Anyone got any video of what's happening up there? It's really hard to prove that, but I can prove that he began cleansing the temple here. Amen. Very easy. And that is the strongest argument that we've neglected. Now, I'll get to that in just a minute. First, let's talk about the dates. We read here in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. It says, um, I'll read 13 too. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Now think about that. Can the devil trample underfoot the sanctuary in heaven? No. Can he? But do all these prophecies in Daniel tell us that the beast is going to trample underfoot God's sanctuary on earth? His people? All of those prophecies talk about this horn making war with his people. So the sanctuary on earth was being trampled underfoot, not to mention the gospel itself. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But then he, he doesn't give the starting point. 2,300 days from when? Daniel chapter 27. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 27. There's no chapter 27 in Daniel. And I fainted and was sick for days afterward. Daniel fainted before he, he could finish with the vision. It's not until 9, Daniel chapter 9, the angel comes back and gives the interpretation. Chapter 9, let's go there very quickly. And you have to jump down to verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for thy people to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now this is the prophecy that tells when the Messiah would come, begin his ministry, and ultimately die. Here is the verse. Verse 25. Someone want to read that for me? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. All right, so here he's telling us from this point, the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince. And he gives us the time frame for this first 490 year prophecy. The only starting point that you're going to find for chapter 8 is that same starting point in chapter 9. They are all part of one prophecy dealing with God's people and the cleansing of God's people and a war on God's people. So there's no question there. You notice there's no vision in chapter 9 of Daniel. I mean, you got chapter 2's got a dream of a metal man, and then you've got chapter 7, you got the lion and the bear and the leopard and the strange beast. Chapter 8, you got the goat and the ram. Chapter 9, you've got angel comes to explain the other vision. There's no, see what I'm saying? There's no vision of any animals or, or idols or things like that. So it has to be the starting point that is given, the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. That command is found in Ezra chapter 7. It occupies about half the chapter, the actual decree. There were three decrees that gave them permission to go back to Israel and complete different things, but the most complete decree was the decree of Artaxerxes. There's actually three Artaxerxes, but this was Artaxerxes along the minus. I can't remember how you say his name. But... Um, He's the one who gave the final decree. It's a very well-established date. It's even in the book of Ezra, 457 B.C. Now, you want to hear something? If you go from 457 B.C., and keep in mind, some people got mixed up and they came up originally with 1843, because with A.D. B.C. dating, if you stay with me, this can be confusing. When you count down from 4 B.C., 3 B.C., 2 B.C., 1 B.C., 0 B.C., 1 B.C., 2, uh, 1 A.D., 2 A.D., it doesn't work that way. There's no zero. And so it's going 3 B.C., 2 B.C., 1 B.C., 1 A.D., 2 A.D., 3 A.D. Now you have to think about this and make a little marks on a piece of paper and you'll find out that you're actually losing one year because they, they sandwich one against one. So they had to add one year to, for the year zero. And so it comes to 1844. Now that is a very interesting year. I did a little homework. Uh, maybe I should even post this. Well, let me tell you what happened in 1844. I think it's significant that in 1844, a man named uh, Charles Darwin, he had written his theses out that became basically the foundation for evolution called the On the Origin of Species was the title of the book. He didn't release it for about 10 years because he knew that it would cause quite a bit of stir, which it did. But he wrote that in 1844. By the way, his father was a pastor. In 1844, another man named Karl Marx, do you remember that name? He with a partner, and his father was Jewish, but had abandoned the Jewish faith. 
He wrote something called the Communist Manifesto, which became the birth of communism, which was an atheistic government. A lot was happening that year. Something else you'll find interesting? Electronic communications began with telegraph. You know what year that was? 1844, Samuel Morse sent the first message. You know what the message was? The first electronic message. When our TV programs were broadcasting and the radio and the tape, and you know, that, all of that is electronic communication. Up until then, everything was done through audio or paper or you hand deliver things. Electronic communications began in 1844. That has gone around the world. And you know what he said? Samuel Morse said, what hath God wrought? This, that was the first message. What hath God wrought? Let me tell you what else happened in 1844. Religiously, some interesting things were going on. The YMCA was founded. In 1844, it started out as a great institution. Um, the Baha'i faith, this is just an interesting bit of trick. You know, Baha'i is a very quickly growing movement. How many of you have heard of the Baha'i religion? Let me see your hands. Some of you have not heard of the Baha'i religion. Um, matter of fact, their headquarters in Haifa, they're under the bombing that's happening right now in the news. But uh, they're all over the world. There are many churches. There's a church right here in, in Sacramento, all over North America. One of the principal things in their belief is based on 1844. Did you know that? They used Daniel chapter 9. And when they calculate Daniel chapter 9, they came to the exact same date. That has nothing to do with us. They just, the facts are there. You can't come up with any other conclusion. Uh, the Baha'i faith uses Daniel 8.14 to validate 1844 when the Bop, who is the forerunner to their prophet, made his declaration to the world that he was a manifestation of God. Um, something else. Joseph Smith. Recognize that name? The prophet for the Mormon faith. He was killed by a mob in 1844. And Brigham Young was elected to be the president. And then they moved to Salt Lake City. Um, I could go on and on just a lot. Oh, and of course, 1844 marks the beginning of the last age of the church, which is the church of Laodicea. And you know what Laodicea means? A judging of the people. This idea that Adventists have invented this concept that there is a judging of the people. My Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what will the end be of them that obey not the gospel? Are we making up a doctrine? Read Ezekiel 9 where it says that uh, these angels went among the, starting in Jerusalem, they went with these destroying weapons. And it says, begin at my sanctuary. And so they began with the ancient men, judgment in the house of God. And th this teaching is so clear in the Bible. But it's very troubling to some churches that we are living in the sight of a holy God and there is a judgment. That there's a judgment that takes place before Jesus comes. Anyway, I thought you'd find that interesting about uh, 1844. Now, um, going back to the 490 year prophecy, uh, I don't want to take too much time because we've had other lessons on this. It's divided up first in seven weeks, then three score and two weeks. That'd be a day is a year. Some are not listening to the previous lesson, so I've got to cover this again. Seven weeks would be 49 days. If a day is a year in prophecy, that would be 49 years. Oh, by the way, we're not the only ones who believe this. Let me, I was reading this morning in Adam Clark's commentary. Though literally, Daniel chapter 8.14 should read 2,300 evenings and mornings, yet I think, I'm quoting Adam Clark, the prophetic day should be understood here as in other parts of this prophet, meaning Daniel, to signify years. So even Adam Clark said you've got to apply years because you apply days and it doesn't ever come to anything. Um, so you've got the first 49 was because the street and the wall would be built in troublous times. It was 49 years before they were able to complete the temple and the streets and the walls and it was during great persecution. Just read Nehemiah. Um, then there were 62 weeks until from that time until the anointing of the Messiah. It says to anoint the most holy. The word Messiah means the anointed. The word Christ, Christos, means the anointed. That's the Greek word for it. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He began his uh, ministry at his baptism. That was another 62 weeks later or a total of 483 years. Now it says he will confirm the covenant with your people for one week. Some believe that the one who is confirming the covenant is the Antichrist. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the midst of the week, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Who is it that made a covenant? Where is there a covenant that is ever made with anybody but the Jews? The covenant under which we are saved is a covenant with the house of Israel. The new covenant that I will make after those days is with the house of Israel. When he says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, what is the subject of the whole prophecy? Daniel's people. How much more time for them to complete their purpose as a people? Literal Israel at that time was to introduce and proclaim the Messiah, which they did at Pentecost. The 12 apostles were Jews who then proclaimed to the devout Jews gathered from every nation that Jesus was the Messiah. They took it then around the world. So for the first three and a half years, Christ in person confirmed the covenant. 
Someone read for me Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to, to us by those who had him? The gospel spoken first by the Lord three and a half years later confirmed by those that heard him. Remember when Jesus ascended, he said, As the Father sent me, so send I you. First, I will do it three and a half years. In the midst of the week, three and a half years after he was baptized, he caused the sacrifice to cease. He fulfilled, and not for himself, but for others. He died, he was cut off. Matter of fact, I want someone to read for me Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. All right, so there's no question the one who is cut off in the midst of the week is who? It's the Messiah. You know, it is so sad and it is so heartbreaking that a number of dear Christians out there believe that the one who confirms the covenant is the Antichrist. They take that verse that you find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there come a falling away first. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself all above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And they think that in order for the Antichrist to sit in the temple of God, the earthly temple must be rebuilt. But the temple over which the Antichrist sits is the one we've been talking about on earth, God's people. He puts himself, sets himself up over God's people and says, I am the supreme authority. I am the vicar for Christ in the world. That's putting yourself in the place of God over the temple of God. And so that was the fulfillment. But there's this whole, it's basically a Jesuit interpretation of prophecy that was developed by Francisco Rivera that says it's the Antichrist that is going to confirm the covenant. Where does the Antichrist ever make a covenant to confirm with anybody? And to call the Messiah the Antichrist and get those two confused, can you mix up anything more dangerous than that? To call Satan Jesus and Jesus Satan? You know, it, it, part of the problem is, let me go back with me to Daniel chapter 9. It says here in uh, verse 26, after 62 weeks, Messiah is cut off. Well, it is after the 62 weeks, he's cut off. But not for himself, he's cut off for us. And then sort of as a footnote, Daniel's told by the angel, the people of the prince who are to come, the Roman power, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, meaning the earthly sanctuary would be destroyed. And the end of it will be with a flood. It's not talking about a water flood. They often talked about an army that would overwhelm them as a flood. Till the end, the wars and desolations are determined. The earthly sanctuary was destroyed in 70 AD. But the subject of this is the Messiah. Then he's going back and he's saying he will confirm. It's going back. That was just a footnote. A footnote. It should have been parentheses. He, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he'll bring it to an end of sacrifice and the offering. All right, so that takes us to three and a half years, AD 31, Jesus dies. And we've got some charts here that you can look at that outline the 490-year prophecy. Christ is baptized in 27 AD. One of the well-established dates you find in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. 31 AD, Jesus dies in the midst of the week. He confirms it in person for three and a half years. Then for three and a half years, as we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, it's confirmed through those that heard him. What happens at the end of that period? Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned in AD 34. He dies just like Jesus died. Taken out of the city, prays for the forgiveness of those who are killing him. He preaches before the Sanhedrin just before he's condemned. He's like a model of Christ. They take away his clothes, and they lay the clothes down at the feet of someone named Saul, whose name is later changed to Paul who now becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting that in 34, and by the way, the Jewish Supreme Court, they plug their ears, they take Stephen out, they don't want to hear the gospel. That marks a very somber point for the nation. They had completed their 70 weeks, were cut off for them, their time allotted to introduce the Messiah. Then the gospel not only went to the Jews, but it went to the Gentiles. You keep reading in Acts, in Acts chapter 10, Peter now goes to Cornelius' house. You remember what a struggle that was for him? Because they were only going to Jews up to that point. Jesus had said, don't go to the uh, way of the Gentiles. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So finally, they broke out of the shell of just Jews, and they began to take the gospel to the Gentiles, who then became grafted into the stock of Israel. And so uh, that was 34 AD. But wait, back to 1844. Going back to 457, if you go from 457 and you count the 2,300 evenings and mornings, some will say, it's 2,300 days. That's 2,300 years. By the way, for those who insist that it's evenings and mornings, listen carefully. Some people say you can't call it a day for a year here because it's evenings and mornings. What is the subject of the sanctuary being cleansed? Isn't that the Day of Atonement? How often did the Day of Atonement come? 
once a year. So, if the subject is the cleansing of the sanctuary, and it's saying 2,300 cleansings of the sanctuaries, if it happens once a year, what does that add up to? It's 2,300 years. Either way, you can't escape it. It's 2,300 days of atonement, or it's 2,300 years. It comes to 1844. And what would happen? The sanctuary would be cleansed. What happened in 1844? In heaven, Christ entered into the last phase of his high priestly ministry, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, do, do buildings get saved, or do people get saved? Did Jesus die to redeem and cleanse buildings or people? What's happening there is mirrored in what's happening here. What happened in 1844 on earth? There was this great religious awakening. Matter of fact, I was reading here about Joseph Wolfe. And not only were the Millerites uh, called Adventists, Adventists weren't all Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists weren't formed until 1863. Adventists were from all different churches. They believed in the second coming of Jesus in 1844. There's one incredible Jewish convert named Joseph Wolfe who was a minister. Between 1821 and 1845, he went, listen to this, he went according to his journals to preach the speedy advent of the Lord and they all thought Jesus was coming because they thought the earth was a sanctuary. Palestine, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, they didn't take jets back then. Georgia, through the Ottoman Empire, this is one guy, Greece, Albania, Turkestan, Hindustan, Holland, Scotland, Ireland, Constantinople, Jerusalem, St. Helena, and New York City. One guy, let's talk about the protection of the Lord to keep you alive. There's a Catholic priest in South America that studied and learned these things and he began to preach the same thing around South America. That Jesus was coming in 1844. It was a global movement. But then he didn't come. Why? Because they misunderstood the prophecy. All of that proves that it's not true. Wait a minute. What about when Jesus died on the cross? Did the disciples misunderstand those prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah? Did that mean they weren't his disciples? No. It's not the first time God's people have misunderstood the event. It was a great disappointment. They said, we thought he was the one that would deliver Israel. They had the, the date right. They had the event wrong. Did God begin cleansing the sanctuary in heaven in 1844? Yes. What happened on earth? Remember what Daniel chapter 8, 14 said? This beast power would cast the truth to the ground. So what needed cleansing? His sanctuary needed the truth restored. In 1844, God began a movement that grew into the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is a hodgepodge of people from all different denominations and races and peoples, one of the fastest growing movements in the world today. And in 1844, they rediscovered the truth about baptism by immersion that had been lost. They discovered the truth about salvation by faith. Some churches were working for it. They discovered the truth about the state of the dead, that they sleep until the judgment and the resurrection. They discovered the truth that hell is not burning forever and ever. That came from medieval paganism. They discovered the truth about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Joseph Bates, sea captain, one of the founders of the Adventist Church in 1844 was sharing that. Then there's Rachel Oakes, who was a Seventh-day Baptist, who was sharing the truth about the Seventh-day Sabbath. All these truths came together from various Millerites and Adventists. They said, maybe we've misunderstood. And they studied, they also learned the truth about the sanctuary. And that movement, the very evidence of the truth of that movement, can be seen that God began cleansing his people on earth, the sanctuary on earth, his church on earth. Jesus died not to cleanse buildings, but people, right? from the defiling doctrines of paganism that had been corrupting every sacrifice of truth is a smear against Jesus. Christ is the truth. The truth will set you free. Every distortion of the truth is a distortion of the face of Christ. And the Seventh-day Adventist teachings really are a return to the teachings of Adam and Eve. Were they Sabbath keepers? Amen. Did they look forward to the second coming? Amen. And they were vegetarians. <laughs> I mean, it goes back to the teachings of the apostles, the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Were the apostles Sabbath keepers? Sure they were. Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. Did they believe in the health message? Yeah, so, I mean, you could, it's nothing unique or new or bizarre. It's biblical truth. All right, very quickly, let's review this then. 457 B.C. is the starting point for not only the 490-year prophecy that ended in 34 A.D., but it's a starting point for the 2,300-year prophecy that in 1844 judgment would begin. Is everybody who takes the name of Christ and on the church rolls or even part of literal Israel, does that mean that they're really committed to Christ? Do we all agree that there are some people who may be on the books on earth but they're not on the books in heaven? And so there is an investigation to determine the genuineness of those who have professed to follow Christ. Do you automatically get caught up to meet the Lord in the air when he comes because your name are on the church books? Does the Bible tell us in Daniel 8, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 7, the judgment was set and the books were opened. And the dead, small and great, are judged out of those things that are written in the books. 
there is a judgment that takes place. Is that a judgment where we all stand one by one before the Lord in this long line that looks like the DMV? And uh, you're waiting for your judgment? No, this is a judgment where it says 10,000 times 10,000 are gathered before him. The angels are involved in looking. You see, sinners, angels see what we do. It's, they see things that no one else sees because they're angels. When you think that nobody sees, angels see, right? And God is saying, I want to introduce these people back into our holy communion. And that probably makes some of them nervous because that's how sin, you know, had to get cast out of heaven. And so the Lord is demonstrating that they really have been transformed by the gospel. Not just because they go to church once a week or make a profession, but there is a, con a, a continuity. That's why God said to Daniel that he is highly loved. That's why they said they found no fault in him when they even followed him around with spies. Dan, the king said, your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. God is going to be evaluating those who are not Christians in word only, but in deed. Has the gospel, is it a profession with our mouths or a profession with our lives? Is it just lip service or is it heart service? Have we been transformed? Are we new creatures? Do we have the fruits? Um, this is what's happening during the investigative judgment. Now you might be uh, concerned, and you should be actually, we should all be uh, praying that we can live in a way that pleases the Lord, right? But the judgment begins with the ancient men, the Bible says, who went out of Christ's presence when the woman was caught in adultery, beginning with the eldest, even unto the least. So who does this judgment begin with? Those who died long ago, obviously, why would God start judging the living if he could start with the dead? You want to give the living as much time as possible because the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Does that make sense? And so when, eventually he's going to come to the names of the living. And by the way, is this judgment so God can find out? No. Does the, the very fact that God has to find something out means he's not really omnipotent or omniscient. God doesn't need to find anything out. It's not for him. There are other intelligent beings in heaven that desire to look into these things. And it's demonstrating that we have been transformed and that God has a right to bring us into that city. And so that we are new creatures. A very important truth.